U.S. markets have changed course after opening higher. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is now down triple digits. For more on what's behind this reversal in equities and where markets are headed from here, we're pleased to introduce Sarah Hunt, the Senior Associate Portfolio Manager with Alpine Mutual Funds. Sarah says she's cautiously optimistic on the markets right now. Her Alpine Dynamic Transformations Fund is in the 96th percentile year to date. Sarah, it's great to have you. Thank you. So what are we seeing today with this big sell-off in equities? Are people perhaps wising up? Maybe stocks have come too far, too fast. A lot of issues about valuations being raised of late. Well, I think that there's a big valuation issue. As we were just discussing, there's a top line issue. You know, you're seeing a lot of companies beat earnings, but they're not beating them because sales are great. They're beating them because they've taken costs out. And while that's fine for a certain period of time, at some point, you need to actually get that top line moving again. And I think there might be some concern there. What's it going to take to get that top line moving again? That's going to be real troublesome to get unemployment back in a better picture. Well, I think that's the problem, is that if you've saved all this money because you've gotten rid of people, that's only worked so long. And unless you get the top line moving, you don't rehire those people. So that employment picture still stays sort of grim. And that I think there's some concern about that going forward. Okay, so what exactly needs to be done? What do you want to see for companies to increase their revenue? And what industries are specifically best poised to do that? Well, I think that there has been some decent growth outside of the United States. The United States is a little bit still stuck in our own recession, but if you look at some of the emerging markets, you're starting to see growth there. So companies that have exposure to that will start to see growth on the top line. So that should be helpful. If that doesn't then kick into switching over to the sort of OECD countries like Europe and the U.S., also getting consumer spending and general business spending back up, I think that that's where the disconnect may be, is that we want to see a ladder that goes from here to there, and if we don't get that, it, I think people will be worried. There's a lot of demand for technology and technology-related companies. Could that be an impetus to get this spending going? Well, there's certainly plenty of places in the world that don't have the levels of technology that we have here, so there's certainly a lot of room for certain types of things to expand. The question is, do they, are you going to have the money to do that in those places, and is the U.S. going to be able to pick things up as that sort of slows down? A lot of talk and concern about the falling U.S. dollar, so much so, in fact, that might be what's behind the dollar's reverse in course today. But if a declining dollar forces foreign investors to dump U.S. assets, how troublesome is that going to be? I mean, is that going to wipe this rally clean out, or how do you see that shaping up? Well, the flip side of that is a low dollar means that our assets are cheaper than they used to be. So that you, should benefit, so, et cetera, et cetera. So, Right. So you, should, you can also make an argument that our stock market looks cheap compared to Europe's stock market because mm -hmm. the currency has been hurt so much. And that historically, the dollar usually will have some sort of a turnaround because it is a really important currency. So the fact that it hit lows today may be why it's bounced up off of those. So do you think, though, we could hit zero value? Some have suggested, including Mark Faber, have said actually this morning on Bloomberg Television. <laughs> well, you know, I think it's just a really... <laughs> Nobody wants to see the dollar continue to be weak because ultimately that's problematic. At the same time, there's a lot of reasons that our economy is slower to recover than a lot of others. So it may stay weak for a while. That's going to help our exports, but it's going to hurt a bunch of other things. So in regard to stock market valuations and what's going on broader picture, the economist Andrew Smithers said the S&P is about 40 percent overvalued and headed for a drop as central banks pull back on the securities purchases that have basically been booing asset prices up till now. So how important is the Fed's role in maintaining U.S. asset values right now? I think there's been a lot of arguments about quantitative easing and how much that's contributed to the run-up in the markets. I think the concern is that as that goes away and they start talking it down, that there will no longer be that underpinning. And I think that that, combined with the fact that you've got multiples that are quite high, relatively speaking, has got some people concerned. Now, the flip side of that argument is, yeah, but we were, were the markets are where they were in the you know late 90s from a valuation perspective if you look at some of the prices. So that earnings power has changed between then and now. Now, but there's going to be a lot of tension between the different the different arguments about what's going on and the fact that the stock market has run so far so quickly is going to potentially at least have it take a pause here. So with the stock run and then you've got the issue of the global picture and central banks who's going to raise interest rates first you have our system flooded with dollars so you question inflation and then people have been talking about reflation too which is what this rally has been about. How do you reconcile all of it. What's the Fed's role. Well, I think that they are probably having a lot of conversations about that themselves. And I know that they they keep putting out statements in an attempt to calm people and to keep keep the idea that they're going to try to keep things on a measured pace and not make any sudden moves. But you've got a lot of concern about dollars out there and whether or not the velocity picks up, because that's where inflation will pick up. Because right now, we just don't have a lot of velocity. And that
translates into an interest rate increase here in the U.S. when? A lot of people say late next year. Where do you stand? I, I think it's going to depend a lot on what's going on economically. I think the data on unemployment and the data on housing, a lot of that is going to factor into when they think that they can raise interest rates because there's going to be real concern if the underlying economic backdrop is still pretty weak, that if they do that, it's going to weaken things further. So there's going to be a lot of tension with that first move because that first move is going to presage further moves, right? So you got to be really careful about the timing of that. Are you in the V camp or the double dip W camp for recovery? I'm not sure which letter I qualify for, but I think that the, the issue is that you're going to get some sort of a bounce and then it's not going to go anywhere, either not back down again, but not back up. And there is clearly people are looking for things to recover and recover in sort of a straight line. And without that straight line recovery, people may get tired of waiting for things to get better. And, that, and that's sort of my concern from a valuation perspective. GDP comes out this week, the adjusted third quarter. 3.2% is the analyst forecast or the economist forecast. Does that sound about right? Is that consistent with, with where you go because this is the forecast for the big jump from negative GDP now to positive and expansion. Well, I think the issue with GDP for, the, for Q3 is gonna, you're going to have a lot of that auto, the cash for clunkers sure. program in there. So I'm not sure that you can annualize that or do very much with that particular number. I think the, the question is going to be what happens to the ISM numbers after and what's going to happen now that you've got no longer, do you, you no longer have that program anymore, right? So people are going to be looking to, maybe that quarter was aberrant, maybe it wasn't. I think it's going to be hard to isolate that and take that as a, as, and, and go forward with it. So let's sum it all up here as we come down in our time together. How are you advising clients? What's the best way to be invested in this climate? Well, I think what we're looking for right now in terms of opportunity are companies that have not had a huge run and or are, were basically dependent on a growing world economy. So if you look at some of the engineering and construction stocks and you look at some of the areas where things haven't moved too much. If we are getting a global build and, and people start ordering again and you start seeing some of these larger big projects go forward, then you've got some upside. If you don't see that, the backlog may be able to keep you fairly safe for a while. So it's partially safety and partially looking for some place that's got some room to move to the upside. Okay, so in terms of asset allocation, do you still like U.S. stocks at this level? We are mixed between U.S. and European generally, and we, I mean, we and emerging markets. So we have a, a global perspective. Um, I think the U.S. stocks, compared to some of the European stocks, certainly look less expensive. But from an overall perspective, you do have some some high valuations out there. So it's just looking for places that haven't experienced that yet. Um, are you experiencing? Do you see a lot of cash on the sidelines still? There's a lot of controversy about whether or not that stays there, whether or not that gets invested. Um, I think that there is some there, but I think that people are cautious since it's run so much. If you haven't participated, do you want to jump in right now?